Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth. Coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Just everybody's recovering from John Schnepp's birthday celebrations last night. <laughs> Speaking of the devil, John Schnepp. Hey, I'm recovered. What's up? I had lots of different kinds of beers at the Golden Brewery. It was very fun. I'll see your Perry number off. I feel bad I wasn't there. But happy birthday, Schnapp, again. Thanks. thanks. Sorry, just to clarify, you weren't invited. No, oh, I wasn't no. invited. Oh, no. I was invited. No. Easy. I, I was she just was the totally asshole invited. who went to a screening instead of going to this great guy's no. birthday, and I feel terrible about it. Also, here's Mark Ellis. Totally might have maybe been invited, but I showed up anyway. Why? Because it's a brewery. What am I going to do? Not go? It's a brewery. I was there anyway. Here's, here's a little inside uh, thing. I, I mean, I knew this before, but last night I saw it again. Uh, I, I mentioned this earlier today, but you can tell uh, when you go up to John Schnepp if he's already... Had a few. Because the way I describe it is, he when he looks at you, he, l he has this look on his face as if you just said something really amusing, although you haven't said anything yet. So it's like, you come up behind, I came up behind him and say, hey, Schnapp. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> That's right. Several drinks in. Everything and I good. got there a little late, so it's totally acceptable. <laughs> anyway, all right. Hey, guys, listen, before we get to the stuff that's in our sidebar here, a brand new Transformers trailer had dropped, of course. Right or wrong, this is going to be one of the biggest films of the year. The trailer dropped. We got a number, a, a look at a number of new clips and scenes inside this trailer. Mark Ellis, you had a chance to take a look at it. What do you think about the new Transformers John, trailer? I might echo your sentiments because this is the best trailer that I've seen for Transformers the last night which is not a really high bar. It's like saying, you know, this was the best bout of diarrhea I had this week. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's not going to win anybody over. That was a good one. When yeah. you see it, no, it was actually a really bad one. Um, so you watch this trailer, and I like the action in here. I'm still very confused as to what the storyline is going to be with Optimus Prime. I still want to see more from the Arthurian times, more of whether we're actually going to be going up against Nazis or not. But what I saw in the Last Night International trailer, and they tend to do this with international trailers, is you get to see more of the action. And so I like seeing those shots because that's one of the appealing things about Transformers trailers. Now, once I get into the theater, the thing that bugs me about Transformers movie, besides the humor and them throwing Bud Light every five seconds and the terrible dialogue, is that the action sequences seem too mishmash. You can't really tell what is what. That was not the case with what I saw in this trailer. I actually got to see, oh, okay, that robot's fighting that robot. So it looked a little cleaner. Hopefully we get more of this in the movie. But I say hopefully with a giant grain of Dead Sea Salt. <laughs> um, yeah, I. this is the best trailer they put out for this movie so far. Again, that is not a high bar. Uh, this is the first Transformers movie that I have thought all the marketing has been terrible. There was that one special behind the scenes kind of, not behind the scenes thing, but more of a almost mini docu-style thing they put out with the um, uh, Anthony Hopkins bit that I thought, okay, that was that's interesting. I liked the trailer. I... I do. I think this was a pretty decent trailer. Like, honestly, if they had led with this trailer, if they had started this marketing campaign with this trailer, I would probably once again be drinking the Kool-Aid, buying into thinking, this is the Transformers that's actually going to be good. It won't fool me five times in a row. Uh, but Maybe I would be there. I'm not. I still think this movie's going to be rubbish because I'm not going to... You, you fooled me four times in a row. I'm not going to buy into it again. Actually, I like the first Transformers movie a lot, but the last three have been terrible. But this is a good trailer. And if we're just going to call it for what it is, I think the trailer was really solid. And if they had just started with this thing, I might have a different anticipation level for the movie. But anyway, what did you think about it, Perry? Mm, no. Aww. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this trailer is just... Like a whole mishmash of action. And some of the action looked good. Like the one part that I really did like was that last bit with Bumblebee where he falls apart and puts himself <laughs> back together because that was something new and different and cool and something I could apply to a very specific character. Everything else, it was just, it reminds me of the feeling that I had in the last three Transformers movies while I was in theaters where I had to kind of like sit there and like, like just hold myself together and try not to get a headache and try to focus on one little thing to keep everything straight. It is just, it's like a montage of action. There's no, there's no proper format in terms of just like 
storytelling combined with action to build suspense in a trailer. It just felt like a montage of like the highlights of action scenes in the movie. I am not feeling it. Schnapp? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to really, you know, get behind this uh, this Transformers movie. I mean, I'm not a fan of the Transformers films already, so... Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I didn't hate this trailer. It was, like you said, Perry, a, a bit of a mishmash. I mean, I get those little moments of, like, oh, there's Anthony Hopkins. The history, the true history of the Transformers. And then you're like, ooh, and then a bunch of, st you know, stupid explosions. So it's hard to tell, you know. I really... After seeing four of these films and not digging any of them, um, you were okay with the one that happened took place in Chicago. Or at least yes. there were elements of that. There were like elements that. just because it was, was Spock. The third one it was because Leonard Le Nimoy yeah. was saying like the the, the you know quoting the Star the Trek. Way, to, the yeah, the he was <laughs> quoting Star Trek as a giant robot smashing you know well known bits in Chicago. So I mean that was fun to see just on a pure destruction level. I don't know what to really think about these movies anymore. I think the best thing you can say about this trailer still in any of this marketing material is that it's two and a half minutes. Is that it's two and a half <laughs> right. minutes, and so I can enjoy a can very condensed version of what we're going to get in the entire movie the last night. But I, I can't say that watching this trailer is going to win me over to say, now I'm going to spend 12 of my hard-earned bucks on this movie experience for two and a half minutes. Hours. I mean, it just it's going to be a slog fest, John. I'm concerned that we don't get a lot of that cool history that Anthony Hopkins right. is teasing us with, dude. I feel like it's just going to be like <laughs> 10 minutes of, so this is what the Transformers did in medieval times. Right. This is what they did to defeat the Nazis. This is what they did here. And now let's worry about Optimus Prime saving the day and Mark Wahlberg and all of his adopted kids rescuing us again. Well, it goes back to something we said a couple of weeks ago. Look, the difference between, because people still ask me, like, how come you like the tripe that the Fant uh, Fast and the Furious do, but you don't like the dumb fun in Transformers because the one big difference, the one thing that Fast and Furious has done correctly that the Transformers films have not done outside of maybe the first film is understanding that we've got to care about the characters. If you don't make us like and care about the characters, then when you go into all these big action sequences, it's just visual noise. When you care about the characters, the big action sequences become fun and you have emotional stakes in it and you as an audience member are invested in it. When they don't, you don't. They got us, they did a pretty good job in the first one introducing us to Sam Witwicky and us getting introduced to Sam. But ever since then, I mean, the girl, the hot blonde girl that's actually a mini transformer. Mark Wahlberg's character, and I love Mark Wahlberg as an actor, but Mark Wahlberg's character in that last film was garbage, just awful and his daughter was worse and her daughter's boyfriend i couldn't wait for them all to die <laughs> i just wanted them to die the only one i didn't want to die died early tj miller and in yeah, a horrible yeah, weird like let's one, rotate around the guy. body yeah like watch him in freezing dying and then explode if like, they kill off gerard carmichael in the same way i'm gonna be i can't have any more comedians no. die in these movies but, but I, i'll say this having said that if michael bay can tap back into that and get to the point where okay my first priority, if he understands that this movie goes, my first priority, I've got to get the audience on board with the characters. And if he does that, then all of a sudden the action becomes great. <laughs> Do you, you laughed when I said that? And I don't blame you at all. Look, at, look, go watch this trailer that we're talking about right now and think about that statement. Do you see even just the slightest hint of that anywhere okay, in there? In the trailers, no. But let's <laughs> let's go back to something like um, The Rock. When you go back to The Rock, right? One of the reasons those stupid, like all the great action in the movie mm -hmm. works is because they got us in, we, we got attached to the Nicolas Cage character. We got attached to the general. We we started to like the characters, the good and the bad. So when these ridiculous things, Sean Connery's plight, so when all these things start to happen, he is capable, Michael Bay is capable of getting us attached to characters. It's just, he's paid no attention to it at all in these Transformers 13 movies. hours, man. The guy, 13, no, in 13 the hours, The guy did. can get us interested in characters, and occasionally Jeffrey Dahmer can also not eat people. It's just not what he's famous for. And I think you're going to go back to the same schlock in this Transformers. Well, we're, we're getting closer, and we will find out pretty soon. Yeah. We can all be hopeful. All right, what's the first official story of the day? Yesterday brought news that Robert Zemeckis, Matthew Vaughn, and Sam Raimi are on the shortlist to direct the Flash for Warner Brothers in DC Films. The rap claimed Robert Zemeckis is the front runner for the gig, followed soon after by Variety, who added Kingsman Heller and Matthew Vaughn into the mix. THR soon followed, adding Raimi to the other two, saying all three are being seriously considered. Both THR and the rap, however, are saying Zemeckis.
Zemeckis is the leading contender at this time, as originally reported by Screen Junkies. The Flash was originally slated for a March 16, 2018 release, but sources at The Wrap say Warner Brothers wants to get the film right and is not rushing the project, with THR saying the studio is willing to wait for Zemeckis to film his next project before moving forward on The Flash. John, thoughts on the shortlist of directors for The Flash? It's a really fascinating shortlist, as a matter of fact. And I'm going to, uh, this might make me the odd person out. The name I'm least interested in is Robert Zemeckis for this. Not because Robert Zemeckis hasn't delivered us some great things. By the way, if you haven't seen Zemeckis' like, that motion capture movie he did, Beowulf, mm. I thought that was actually really fun. Yeah. So mm -hmm. check out Beowulf if you haven't. And obviously we owe him Back to the Future and Forrest Gump, and, and he's done some great ones. I just, it, it comes down to that word I use all the time. I don't see it as a fit. I don't know that Robert Zemeckis will bring the sensibilities to The Flash that The Flash needs and that the audience is looking for in this. The other two names, however, are very intriguing. We haven't seen Sam Raimi do a comic book film since, granted, his stumble on Spider-Man 3, but he still did Spider-Man 1 and 2, mm -hmm. okay? So he's he's got a winning percentage right now. And obviously the other guy who, uh, he's, he's had some hits as well. No, both of these names I'm really intrigued by. If Disney, and sorry, if Warner Brothers can see through it to just get past the, the prestige of the name Zemeckis. And don't get me wrong, if they announce Zemeckis is gonna be the director, I'm not jumping off the train or anything like that. that that's fine, he's a great director. So sure, let's see what happens. Any three of these names are good, but I think there are two of them could be great. So I would lean towards Raimi, actually, on this one. I would love to see Raimi's take on The Flash, because The Flash is that kind of character that I think Raimi would really sink his teeth into. I don't know, Mark, what do you think? I don't think the name Zemeckis is that much, you know, more sparkly than Raimi or Vaughn, but that's the problem that I have, is that would I like to see any of these three guys' interpretation of The Flash? Sure, I love a lot of the movies they make, but I see these three names, and I see DC continue to hunt for the most famous person they can get to direct a movie, and I would prefer to have a more diverse-looking shortlist than that. I prefer to see more women's and minority, more female and minority directors able to be competing for these jobs, and I don't know what happens behind closed doors. These may be the people that get reported because those are the sexiest names that they have, which is fine, but I would prefer to see a more differentiated looking list. Now, having said that, would I like to see a Robert Zemeckis take on The Flash? Of course I would. But this makes me nervous because you have so many famous directors that have been attached to DC projects, then they get in the room, then they leave a month from, you know, after they, they signed on the deal. So it bothers me that this is who we're talking about for The Flash because I'd like to see more of a Marvel model where you take somebody who's a little more unknown, who has done a smaller project and is now ready for the big time as opposed to people who have already been doing this for so long. They've already done great comic book properties, so let's bring in somebody else and give them a shot. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I'm actually kind of happy to see, you know, some of the big boys in contention here because the one thing that has me particularly nervous with DCEU movies is the fact, it, we brought it up yesterday, that they're reactionary. And I think that that could lead them to maybe pushing particular directors in a certain direction while they're making their movie. And that's more likely to come into play when you have a newcomer that they can kind of push around. These guys, not so much. And... Based on what I've been reading about all the uh, the shortlist rumors, it seems like Zemeckis is the top choice. He's the, the front runner. And I wouldn't be surprised if he took it. I definitely think he's the most sparkly name of the bunch because he's an Academy Award winning director. It would be great for DC and Warners to get him attached and say, we have an Academy Award winning director directing The Flash. That sounds good to me too because he is very, very talented. He has so many great credits to his name. However, if I had my pick, I would go Vaughn. And one of the reports that I read had said that they think that even if Vaughn is interested, this might have been more of a power play in a way, like take the meeting to get Kingsman 3 going. So if that's the situation, I don't know. Because we hear about that all the time. As much as, you know, I'm sure they all took meetings because they were interested to a degree. It's like you, you, take, you can do things like that behind the scenes to get your passion projects going at other places. And with Raimi, Raimi came out of left field. I was all hyped about the idea of either Zemeckis or Vaughn. And then that last report dropped last night with uh, Raimi being in the mix. And, you know, I love my evil dead. So anything that he touches, I'm going to get behind. And clearly he knows what to do with this type of character. So... 
I don't really care how this pans out. If this is the list it comes down to and one of these guys gets the gig, I'm going to be really happy. Look, when Kingsman 2 makes the money that it's going to make, Vaughn is not going to have any problem getting meetings well, for Kingsman yeah. 3 whatsoever. Right. He's going to he's going to be fighting off their calls. But anyway, what do you you hear these three names? What do you think about the names and which one would be your pick? Well, it's interesting because uh, Matthew Vaughn, a different type of Flash is the one I want to see him do. I want to see him do that remake of Flash Gordon that he's been talking about. Right. He's been, you know, taunting us with, hey, I'm going to do Flash Gordon. I want to see Matthew Vaughn's Flash Gordon. I think he has all the chops to bring that character and uh, that entire world to the big screen in a really fun way. Um, look, between Raimi and Zemeckis, I would, I'd have to go. I mean, they're both incredibly talented. But the one that intrigues me a little bit more is Zemeckis, because I haven't seen his take or his version of a superhero film yet. He's a really talented director. I think he's very, he gets a short, the short end of the stick. I mean, he basically ran Image Movers, which was an entire 3D company. They did Beowulf. They did an, an, an incredible assortment of amazing yeah. 3D films that are very underrated. And then that entire company got shuttered by Pixar. It's a whole un behind the scenes you know, story you don't even want to know about, the horror of Hollywood. But uh, let's just say Zemeckis kind of got shafted. The guy's a genius, and I think I want to see his version of The Flash more than anybody else's. I think if if I couldn't get Zemeckis, what a great second runner-up, Sam Raimi. He's super talent. Everything he touches is amazingly visual. So I would love to see a Raimi Flash version. How is he going to interpret the speed force and things like that? It's a win-win. I just don't want to see Vaughn wasted because I want him to do Flash Gordon. It's just selfish. It's yeah, selfish. Raimi's such an interesting name to me because he... Wants, I think that deep down he wants a mulligan for Spider-Man 3. Mm. I think he wants the ability, which I'm not sure he's going to get with the DC studio and, and having to collaborate with them making the Flash movie, but he really made two, for the time, brilliant comic book movies with Spider-Man 1 Spider-Man 2. One of those two movies had a Nickelback song in it. And so if he goes to the Flash, <laughs> then I think that's cool for him. But Zemeckis is a storyteller that just for whatever reason, the box office results have not been there. Like I think they should have been for that movie, The Walk, which I think was criminally underrated. That was a great movie. It just happens that the documentary based on it was better than the film. And that's not really <laughs> Zemeckis' fault. So for him to get a chance to tell a story that everybody's going to want to see again, I think is a neat opportunity. Yeah, and the one thing you mentioned before, I'll, I'll disagree with you a little bit when you mentioned like, these three big guys who have already had cracks of this type of thing, I don't think them having big success in their backgrounds is a detriment to why we should consider them for, for things like this. Oh, like, right. if you get a Sam Raimi on board who has made two of the iconic comic book movies, in, and I just think he stayed on one property for too long. Now, I know a lot of people want to give Raimi a pass, and I'm a huge Sam Raimi fan. A lot of people want to give Raimi a pass for Spider-Man 3. They say, well, it was the studio's fault because they made him put in uh, Venom. Yeah, right. To which the answer is, then just make a good movie with Venom. I mean, the studio, Joss Whedon didn't want Black Widow in the Avengers. The studio, made, he wanted Wasp. The studio made him take Wasp out and made him have Black Widow. So what did he do? Okay, fine, then I'll just make a good movie with Black Widow. That's what Raimi should have done. But I, I think that was more of a case that not everybody can bat a thousand. Raimi is great. And if you don't know that, look at the Evil Dead films. Look at Spider-Man 1. Look at Spider-Man 2. Matthew Vaughn's resume speaks for itself. The guy in the middle is an Academy Award winner. And, and he's the, the, la the Academy Award winner is the last guy on right. this list to me. I don't think Warner Brothers can go wrong with any of these guys. But as often turns out with stories about the final list has come out for and it usually ends up being another person completely. So we'll sure. have to wait and see if this one actually works out the way we think it will. All right, what's next? According to THR, Zac Efron has signed on to star as infamous serial killer Ted Bundy in a film entitled Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile. The movie will be directed by Oscar-nominated documentary filmmaker Joe Berlinger, which will tell the story of Bundy told through the perspective of Elizabeth Kleffer, Bundy's longtime girlfriend, who went years denying the accusations against Bundy, but ultimately turned him into the police. It was only when his execution drew near when Bundy began talking about his heinous murder when the rest of the world learned the truth of his grisly crimes. <laughs> Principal photography is set to begin on October 9th with a release date yet to be determined. Mark, thoughts on Zac Efron playing Ted Bundy? As the panelist next to me cackles and delighted something, <laughs> I am thrilled to be the first person to answer this question because I am the well-dressed, good-looking psychopath up here at Movie Talk. <laughs> Did that picture of Zac Efron, was he trying to look like Ted Bundy? In that, Because he's wearing like, the same jacket that Bundy wore in his high school picture. Uh, this is actually very cool to me. I, I, I think that, that Zac Efron... This
this is a very different career move than you would expect from a you know marquee teen uh, idol sort of thing. And I think it's a lot better than the movie made last summer with, with We Are Your Friends. This is a very different left turn for Zac Efron. I think he's got the chops to pull this off. I mean, Ted Bundy was a very good-looking, charismatic guy. He just happened to be a mass murderer, too. So if he's playing this and he taps into that character, I actually think this could be a big step forward for Zac Efron in his acting career. Sorry. <laughs> It took me a second because as as Ashley's reading off, she read the lines about uh, Ted Bunny and his heinous murders. For a second, I thought she said his anus murders. <laughs> and so oh, I don't know boy. what those are. He went for the <laughs> anus. I, I just sorry, oh, that was terrible. Look, <laughs> I've said it a long time. L let's not. You shouldn't always equate a actor's choice of movies to be in with what their actual acting ability is. If you've seen movies like Parkland or The Paperboy or especially Me and Orson Welles, mm -hmm. Zac Efron has dramatic chops. The dude can act. I've been saying for a long time. Of course, now on top of all those things, he keeps putting himself in movies like Dirty Grandpa and Mike and Dave Need Weddings and other garbage like that. But don't think that equates what his acting ability is. I think this is exactly the kind of role that he should be in. Now, I don't. Did, did we? Did they mention who the director is? I don't think they did yet, or anything like oh, that. Oh no, they did. Joe Berlinger. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So He's look, a really good director. Yeah, you know he is. And this could end up being. Don't laugh. A couple of years from now, we could be talking about an Academy Award nomination for Zac Efron. This mm -hmm. is the type of role. This is that kind of role that could do it. Maybe he'll blow it, but I have a lot of faith in his acting skill. I think he'll do quite well. That's kind of where my mind was going when I first read this story and thinking about Efron in that role is, you know, maybe this could pave the way to a nomination. But then I'm also thinking it, it's either that direction or it's the polar opposite. And this is some yeah. sort of epic fail along the lines of, I don't know what Lindsay Lohan movie is coming to mind, but something where, you know, he tries <laughs> to be like super serious and evil and it just comes across as, as laughable and silly. But I don't know. I, th I think I'm veering more in that direction. I'm really excited to see Efron step away from the big studio comedies right now because I actually think he is very good at that kind of stuff. He is definitely funny in Neighbors, and those roles yes, are he real. Yeah. He's really well suited for those. He's not been doing a bad job in that territory, but he is also just a, a very talented, dramatic actor, and it's about time he gets back to something like this. And this pairing could be great. Um, the director's name again, Schnapp? Joe Berlinger. Uh, obviously, a very talented uh, documentarian. Mm -hmm. And when you pair that, kind of sensibility with this material, I think that is another reason why we could be leaning more towards a legit potential Academy Award opportunity right. and not in the other direction, yeah. thankfully. When I first heard the title, I thought it was like, wow, what a weird title. But uh, John was mentioning why it's such a weird long title. It's one of the, the sheriff or one of the police officers yeah, made, on, a quote. made a quote. And that was kind of a quote that went around. And so that's why that quote is uh, being used as the title. That aside, I think this has the chance to be something like a Charlize Theron monster, you know, where that's that that kind of like that kind of standout role for someone like Zac Efron. He is a super talented actor. Um, take him outside of the you know his Paperboy or his uh, you know the Seth Rogen comedy stuff that he was doing. You know, he's really funny. That's why he's in Bay Baywatch with The Rock. He's also got a really really good comedic chops. But I think this film is going to give him that chance to be like on that American psycho Christian Bale level because that's the kind of duplicitousness of the of 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 a Bundy. It's a scary guy, fake lying, you know, I mean it's he's a creepy weird serial killer. You have to have someone be able to, you know, have that bizarre veneer and that's what it's going to be about told from the wife's perspective. Sounds like a real horror show. So, I mean, I, I, I'm in. And it's going to be a fun experiment to show kids this movie first and then show them High School Musical and just be like, look at how crazy <laughs> oh. this guy is. It's funny that Perry brought up Lindsay Lohan out of, out of nowhere because she was in that movie, Chapter 27, with Jared Leto, where he also played, he played Mark David Chapman. And I think this movie is probably going to have that sort of... Um, you know, arc where it comes out and people might applaud him for the performance. I don't think it's going to be an Academy Award level movie. I think it comes out and it goes away. But Chapter 27 is a, mm -hmm. it's a chilling performance by Jared Leto. And Lizzie Lohan's good in it too. So check that out if you want other movies about creepy killers. Now, Joe Bronger did direct Blair Witch 2 Book yes. of Shadows. Yes. I didn't bring that up because... <laughs> I, right. I was trying to be nice. Well, I, I wasn't trying to be nice, but I've, I've read enough of that to know. And, you know, it's not... I don't want to make excuses for him, right. but there's been tons of quotes out there saying, you know, I was making a movie this way and the studio wanted this and this and that's why we get so many you, random you scares and action yeah. scenes. You yeah. could see that in the movie. But he also directed that Metallica documentary, uh, 
Uh, uh, some kind of monster. Some kind of monster, thank you. Which I actually, I'm it's, not even a big Metallica guy, and I love that. I'm a huge Metallica guy, and so it's hard to impress me if you're going to do something like that. That that was a phenomenal achievement in the world of documentary filmmaking. All right, guys, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Ashley, what do we got? Fox Searchlight has released the first trailer for Battle of the Sexes, the new movie from the directors of Little Miss Sunshine, Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris. Based on a true story, the movie stars Emma Stone as Billie Jean King and Steve Carell as Bobby Riggs and focuses on their 1973 tennis match when King was number one and Riggs was a retired champ and serial hustler, which became one of the most watched televised sporting events of all time. The match launched a global conversation on gender equality that helped spur on the feminist movement with Riggs trying to protect his reputation while reliving his glory days. The movie also stars Alan Cumming, Elizabeth Shue, and Sarah Silverman. It opens in theaters on September 22nd. Schnapp, buy saw the first trailer for Battle of the Sexes. I'm going to buy it. And, you know, it's like uh, I remember uh, Billie Jean King and, and Riggs and, and all this goofiness. And I remember I was, I was really into tennis when I was a little kid. And I remember I played tennis all the time. I remember watching this and I was into it. And there was a certain point in time when Riggs actually went too clowny, where everyone was like kind of believing in what was going on and like, yeah, yeah it's a war of the sexes, this and that. And then he went like dressed up as a mouse or something and did something really dumb where all the people, the Archie Bunkers of the world were like, yeah, I'm behind Riggs. And then he just clowned them and they were like, screw this guy. And everything kind of fell apart. I think it was like their second match. They did like three or four of them. You know, they, they really milked it. You know, and so by the third, maybe the third or fourth one, where they're all dressed up in disco outfits, it was like, get out of here. So I mean, I think the the movie's going to play up and show a little bit of that, but I like the way they actually reveal that it was all kind of a, you know, a, a you know trick, you know, f from the get. He's like, hey, you know, I'll play the male chauvinist, you be this, you know. It was all a setup. So, Perry, big buy. I love this. I'm really excited for this. I'm a big tennis fan also. I grew up playing so much and watching. It was like a family event to watch the U.S. Open, and I've mm. been a couple times. I'm familiar with this story, and I think this is just an example of perfect casting. And I'm not just talking about the fact that one is now an Academy Award winner and the other has a nomination. They fit these roles so well because of what you brought, brought up with his character. It's like you need to, you need to convey that without it sounding, sounding like like mean and, and hateful right. and it, it needs to have that kind of playful vibe and like who better to do that than Steve Carell and she is just like so freaking charismatic and the two of them working together I think that is going to be the perfect pairing and look at the way this thing is shot it is just so appropriately well done and it feels like it comes from that era I don't think there was any better way to do it and they delivered just the right amount of story I think this mm -hmm. first time where even if you like you get you get what the hook is if you aren't familiar with the true story at all but then there's still left to be discovered in future promos I huge buy for me I love the trailer I, it was everything I hope I like and I never would have recognized Emma Stone mm. uh, from a still I mean watching her act I will I mean this looks like it's perfectly cast um, and Elizabeth Shue taking a break from her adventures in babysitting to come mm. come back. I miss Elizabeth Shue. I Everybody she, does. She's been on CSI or something like that, but I, I don't watch that show. So it's really great to see her back. No, you're right. They played up all the right angles for it. And I think a lot of us who were, you know, this is, this is before our time a little bit, forget that these issues, like today it's, it's the cool thing that whenever any, ever anybody brings up hey, like, let's look at some gender equality and let's look at some fairness, whatever. Uh, there are the brain-dead morons of the world who go, social justice warrior! Uh, so, <laughs> so like, like, just go back and keep humping your sister. Um, so, <laughs> like, but at the time, this was a real huge freaking issue. And like, I think to a lot of people today, our sensibilities now, we hear some of the things that are being said in the trailer and think, you could never say that. That was the stuff that they were saying at the time. And it was just normal. Mm -hmm. And it was the social norm. And it takes revolutionary events like this to start to change the discussion. And we are where we are today because of events like this. And it's going to be more events like this we need to really get to where we need to go as a culture and as a society. But this looks great. It looks funny. I do like the fact that it looks like it's going to the behind the scenes, mm -hmm. tomfoolery that went on, the showmanship yeah. of it and all that kind of stuff, and how we as a culture changed. I'm really looking forward to this. I thought the trailer was great. Uh, it's going to be a huge buyer for the table because just when you look at the performances, Steve Carell 
and Emma Stone have transformed themselves into these characters. I like how the trailer gave us the background of the story for people who aren't aware. And also, as Schnepp alluded to earlier, it goes to that level where it's going to show you the behind the scenes, the wizards that, that are kind of creating this thing, because it may have come from somewhat of a real competitive place, but it also became a, a Jerry Lawler, Andy Kaufman situation where there's going to be the public hype and there's going to be how we actually feel about these events. But when you become a character and you're playing a role and the public starts taking that seriously, what does that do to your real human self and are you taking it too seriously or has this mockery or has this thing become too big for its own good where you can't even control the narrative anymore so i love all the stuff that they showed us in the battle of the sexist movie plus like again it's just that he looks like bobby riggs and she looks like billy jean king this is this is going to be really good you talk about oscar bait this could have that written all over it all right what's next Deadline is reporting that Power Rangers actor Ludi Lin has been cast in the James Wan-directed Aquaman. Lin will play Merc, a trusted ally of Jason Momoa's character and the leader of the Men of War, the frontline army of Atlantis. The role marks the first major casting for Lin since Power Rangers, which bowed in theaters back in March. Lin joins a star-studded cast that includes Amber Heard as Mara, Willem Dafoe as Volko, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II as Black Manta, Patrick Wilson as Orm slash Ocean Master, and Nicole Kidman and Tamora Morrison as Aquaman's parents. The movie is currently in production and is set to open on December 21st, 2018. Perry Byrcell, Ludi Lint as Merc and Aquaman. Oh, gee, I wonder why you tossed this one to me. <laughs> um, I, I will buy it. And I, I think this is probably a good fit. You know, you guys know I love Power Rangers, and now I'm a big fan of the cast because I think they all did good work with what they had. Ludi Lin in particular, though, I wouldn't have minded if the Black Ranger had just a little more meaty material to work with. But I think he has the charisma and the acting chops to be able to pull something like that off if they had given him more material there. And it sounds to me, I was reading up on the character, I mean, Schnepp can probably inform you a little better, but you know, it's, this is a new character in the comics and they describe him as loyal and occasionally stubborn, which is pretty much the exact same way that the Black Ranger was in the Power Rangers. And I thought he worked with the other characters really well in that respect. So it seems like it would translate well here. I'm, I'm excited for him. I'm, I'm excited for him to have more opportunities and I know what that's going to lead to now. I, I buy it. I, I mean, I do. Like, I like the performances all the kids gave in Power Rangers. And you, you know we had Ludi in the, in the cast here in studio a few, uh, maybe a month or two ago. And you couldn't ask for a more delightful guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he comes in, he picks up a lightsaber and like is challenging Jeremy Johns to a lightsaber fight as we're standing around. And his mom's Canadian, so that's all great too. I got to meet his mom. <laughs> Just a delightful kid. But yeah, I mean, since his schedule's freed up, since he's not going to be busy I filming a Power it. Rangers 2. Um, why not? I think this is great. I'm super happy that the guy's going to get a shot at this. It's a really cool sounding character too, so why buy it? All this does, John, is keep him in shape for when he gets the call for Power Rangers 2. Oh, thanks, Harry. Alice. Because that movie is is going to crush in Luxembourg once it opens. Now, <laughs> in the meantime, having Lynn join the cast of Aquaman, I think it's exciting. I like where this character can go, and that kid has real chops that we got to see a little bit of in Power Rangers. And Power Rangers is one of those movies, Perry, I thought the movie was 20 minutes too long, but I could also, if I went for another story, I definitely would want to focus more in depth on all the characters, but particularly his, because he just he's got a lot of interesting stuff going on. One of my favorite parts about what Ashley just read, though, is that I didn't realize or I wasn't on set that day that Tamira Morrison is cast yeah, as, right. as it. That's Aquaman's awesome. Aquaman's dad. Man. I Jack thought it's good. Gonna be Aquaman's dad. It's, his, Aquaman's <laughs> dad is a, might be a clone. Look out. <laughs> what do you think, Snap? Uh, yeah, you know, I didn't get a chance to see Power Rangers. Is it still in theaters? <gasps> no. Okay. It's coming out on DVD soon. And probably, apparently in Luxembourg soon. Yeah, Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Japan. You know, I think just, you know, when they're shooting Power Rangers 2, 3, and 4, this, so you could just drop in and do this role. <laughs> I think, you know, in Aquaman, you have to cast people who are going to die on the front lines. And that's kind of a... <laughs> That's the way I look at it. It's like, you're going to have to have, like, Aquaman is not going to bite it. This just got dark. Yeah. So there have, there have to be characters who you're going to have that, like, moment where it's like, you know, Jarbrule or Scrimlon or whatever. So that he's going to be one of those. That's what John said when call. he hired me to be on Movie Talk. He's like, Mark, we need human shields for this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, what's next? 
In a new Instagram post, photographer Jared Au captured our first look at not one, but two predators on set in the latest Shane Black retelling <laughs> of The Predator. One of the predators is seen inside a tank facing frontwards, with the other riding atop with cast members Travante Rhodes, Keegan-Michael Key, and Thomas Jane along for the ride. The project is aiming for an R rating and reportedly remains in the continuity of the first two movies. It stars Boyd Holbrook, Olivia Munn, Jacob Tremley, Sterling K. Brown, and Edward James. James Olmos. The Predator will be released in theaters on February 9th, 2018. Mark, buy yourself the first look at a Predator in The Predator. What the hell do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> this is a huge, there's Predators on tanks. You go from apes on horses to Predators on tank. That's an upgrade. What the hell are they doing on the tank? It looks like one of them is in a car wash movie. The other one might kind of be driving the tank. So I don't think this is an actual scene that they like took a snapshot. You don't I think, think the is, Predators give peace signs to people? This is actors right. on a break, but I'm glad that they upgraded the Predator costume from the last time we saw one, which was on the Schmoes No set that I had to wear because I lost a horrible bet to Christian Harloff. That that is what a Predator movie looks like. Predators on tanks. Hell yes. John, we have a movie coming out. <laughs> Schnepp, what do you think? Uh, you know, as far as a behind the scenes photo, sure, it's cool to see there's dudes in tanks, there's Predators in the tanks giving us the w Richard Nixon or whatever. It's like, yeah, I mean, it's a behind the scenes picture. Would I have liked to have seen the first photo revealed of the Predator, like a, a well well done publicity a composed photo. composed picture. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would have preferred it's to a see. New, it's a new Predator. They, they're they embracing. He's a little hip hoppy. He's like, hey, you know, I'm on a tank. I would have preferred it's the like, devil horns. The devil horns would have been a little bit cooler. Uh, look, I'm excited. I, I'm very happy to see the original group of uh, Decker and Black working on Predator. So I have my hopes very high. So the, these, you know, somebody snapped a picture of a Predator. You know, it's, it's good that he didn't have the make, make off. I was like smoking a cigar or some dude. Like, hey, I'm a predator. That'd be worse. But I don't have any problem. That is a line from the movie. By yeah, the that's way, right. Hey, I'm that. a predator. Yeah. I what am think, selling this. That this is not an appropriate picture to release. Is is this guy who took this picture like the official set photographer or something? Hell no. I, I cannot I imagine so. that this was approved at all. This is the worst possible way to reveal what the predators look like. This is so damn silly. And like now we're all sitting here and everyone out there is probably like, oh, are, are the humans teaming up with the predators? Are they going to be driving tanks? For all we know, they could have just been, you know, ri bussing everybody to location on mm. a tank because all the actors thought it was cool. Right. This is how you start really bad rumors and you start to you know make people think they're going to get a certain thing blows up in your face the predators look look silly in this photo Who and it doesn't know what a predator looks like it's, still, it's not like you, oh man wh you what are they gonna it, you want to see it the right way the right the right lighting and everything this this to me looks like your predator a little but what about what if the predators are on tanks and they're friendly and doing this <laughs> in the movie that's yeah. not my predator I movie. Now, look, I, will, I don't want to see like a picture of these every day. I think for one still to get me excited to remind me that they're making a predator movie. The big takeaway from this picture to me is that they're making a predator movie. There's going to be multiple predators in it, and there's going to be a tank involved somehow. It's not just busting them the location, Perry. Nobody's like, oh, damn, we're, we're out of we're out of Priuses. It, which, Bring which in the right. tank. You're probably right because you could see that. Uh, are they kind of like dressed like? Are we gonna see yeah. see what I'm doing now? Now I'm I'm buying <laughs> into it. And I'm busy making <laughs> I theories. I will tell you damn what it. this picture means. I, I can tell you the whole thing, the whole story of the next predator. The predators and the humans join up because what this is really is aliens versus predator Burn! three. Oh. The aliens have come to Earth. <laughs> the human soldiers and the predators are working together on no. their anti-alien tanks, <laughs> and they're gonna. I I have no idea. Look, it's it's a fun picture. I buy the picture just because it's fun to see. Now you're right. This does get my brain going about. Okay, so are the humans and the predators actually teaming up to fight something else? Maybe there's a rogue predator that the, maybe these are like predator PIs. Maybe these are like predator cops that come to get the rogue predator. I'm just making crap up <laughs> at this I, point. Can I tell you something? I hate the movie you're writing right now. I hate the movie you're, you're, you're writing a horrible movie right now. <laughs> this movie I'm writing is great. Um, but it, I mean, the predators, Look like predators. I actually, I'm, and I am kind of glad to see that they are going with the traditional, classic look right. of the predator. It doesn't look like they've changed things up very much, which is a good thing because I think we all love the predator. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna for now. I'm gonna buy, it, but it's not blowing my socks off. Okay, this just breaking. Where I'm getting told by the staff here, 
Entertainment Weekly has just dropped a story pertaining to The Flash and the stuff that we talked about a little bit earlier. Apparently, another guy who was in the discussions was another Spider-Man director, Mark Webb, was also in the discussion, but apparently Sam Raimi and Mark Webb have passed on The Flash. They oh, okay. have passed. And also, Billy, I always pronounce Crudup's last name wrong, but Billy Crudup, who was cast to play uh, Ezra Miller's The Flash's dad has left the film. Oh, right. no! So <laughs> Billy Crudup has left no. the film. Uh, Warner Brothers uh, reps are right now are declining any comment uh, on the matter. Apparently Zemeckis, though, and Vaughn are still in the race, so I don't know if an offer got made to Raimi and he passed, or if Webb got made an offer and passed, or whether they just stepped out of the negotiation process before they even got to that point. We will keep our eyes on this and uh, probably update you tomorrow if anything major breaks. In the coming hours, we'll, of course, do a special video here on Collider Video. But did you realize you. the implications of having Billy Crudup play the Flash's dad? He played Steve Prefontaine, one of the fastest people to ever live. And he was <laughs> yes. going to be the Flash's dad. This whole movie's brewing. Well, and also, they already shot his stuff in Justice League. We saw that in a trailer with yes. Ezra Miller. So now that's what these Justice League reshoots are. Is they're like, we got to get a new Flash's dad. It's chaos. <laughs> we got to get a new Mr. Yeah. Flash. They're not, he's not going to, he's not, that footage of him is not going to remain in Justice League if he just left the Flash. No, they'll probably take that. Yeah, so. or, or right around his father in the Flash movie one, but it sounds like that's yeah. probably not the case. All right, what is next? Deadline reports that hackers have allegedly stolen, have in their possession, a copy of Disney's upcoming Johnny Depp film, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. The hackers are seeking a ransom payment in Bitcoin from the studio and will release the movie online if Disney doesn't pay. CEO Bob Iger did not reveal which movie the ransom hackers claimed to have at the time, but Deadline learned that it was indeed Jerry Bruckheimer's fifth movie in the Pirates franchise. Disney is currently working with the FBI and will not pay the ransom. The hackers have said that if Disney does not pay, they will release bits of the film in increments ahead of its scheduled release of May 26. John, do you buy or sell the movie actually hitting online before its May 26 release? Uh, I sell. I don't think it'll hit online. I don't think it'll happen. I, I hope. I, I mean, I don't know. I hope these guys get caught. I mean, this is just stupid. I hope these guys get gonorrhea of the ass. Like, seriously, this is... Yeah. Uh, people who do <laughs> stupid shit like this just infuriate me. Um, and, and look, and I hope Disney doesn't give them anything. And uh, if I, you know, if we know anything about Bob Iger, he's not exactly a guy who can be told what to do. But, I mean, at the same time, it, I'm not in his position. So... If I can speak as a, a the third party who has no invested interest, I go, no, you don't give in to demands of people like this. But, I mean, they may have like hundreds of millions of dollars riding on it. I, I mean, I wouldn't throw the house at the guy if he did give in, but I don't think he will. I don't think they should. And uh, I think if these guys um, are as stupid as they sound, I don't think that anything will happen. So I, I haven't been paying much attention to the story because I think Bob Iger is going to crush him. I really do. But anyway, Schnepp, you heard about all this. What do you think? Sad. I mean, it's like, you know, this has happened to lots of films. I think Transformers 4. I remember Wolverine it got leaked like a month before it was going to come out. Eventually what happens, though, is like, you know, because we're able to track everything that goes on online, you know, there's like little, you know, it's like a little detective. You have to wrap your way around through all the false IPs and whatnot, they eventually get to the people. So whether or not they even release 20 minutes of it, I think it's 20 minutes too much to release. I don't think they should, uh, you know, pay the ransom, so to speak. I think it's, a, it's an ugly situation that's gonna keep happening, especially with big budget films. Uh, I don't support it, so I, I hope that they are able to not pay the ransom and, and somehow catch these guys, who guys, gals, whoever it is, who uh, stole the film and is, are threatening, you know, it's a two, three hundred dollar, three hundred million dollar venture that they're, you know, all thousands of people spent years of their life working on this film and it's all going to be like thrown away because some idiot in a facility wasn't watching a tape or a, a you know, a drive or something. I, you know, that's how it always happens is it takes one or two people to just like hit a download button and ruin it for everyone. So it's, it's kind of sucky. Yeah, Perry. this really has me freaked out for the future. And I wouldn't be saying that if it was just pirates, but we just had the orange is the new black hacking situation, too, where they held it for ransom. They didn't Netflix didn't pay and they released 10 of 13 episodes on on some pirate site. And 
I have a bad feeling the same thing is going to happen here just because I, they don't know who this particular hacker is, if it's the same person or if that it's a person or a group, but if it follows the same path, and it, it seems like too much of a coincidence that it would have happened with that, and then the same exact pattern of events would have been happening with this one also. So if, if that is the case, I don't think Disney's going to pay, nor should they. And then they might do what they did with Orange is the New Black and release it online. And hopefully people are just smart and respectful of the industry and just can be smart enough to know right from wrong because this is freaking awful and I'm kind of terrified that it's going to continue happening. Yeah, it just, it's a headache for Disney because now they have to get a Bitcoin account. Like, who just has <laughs> one of those laying around? Now you got to deposit money into that if you were going to pay them, but the mouse does not negotiate with terrorists. He's got a very special set of skills, skills used to find people like these pirates. I hope they find them. Um, I guess I, I hope that, that uh, the acting director of the FBI doesn't get fired before he can find these people, <laughs> but it would be nice to have this not go down because it's a crappy situation. It is really ironic that it's a bunch of internet pirates that are stealing pirates of the Caribbean. Like, we need to get some old school <laughs> pirates on the case, get them to find the treasure trail. I, I don't know that like, where do you go to watch this, though? Does anybody know? Is this the dark web? Where do you go to watch? The, I'm not asking for me. I'm just curious. Like, okay, we're going to release it online. Where is it online? It's not on YouTube. It's no, not it's on tor video. They torrent it. It's torrenters. So I can yeah, just... The, uh, that's where they probably go. But we'll see how this whole situation works itself out. All right, guys. This, we're running a little bit over time, so we're going to skip our mailbag segment today. But we want to make sure we get to your live Twitter questions for you guys who are watching us live. Just start sending in your questions to us at Collider Video uh, on Twitter there. And Wendy will pick a couple out. I do want to remind you, though, a brand new episode of <coughs> Heroes dropped yesterday, of course, with John Schnepp. Our Alien Covenant review is up. And, of course, every Friday, brand new episodes of our show, Awesome Tacular, on the Verizon Go 90 network with Jerry. Jeremy Johns. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get to some of your live Twitter questions. Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Kiyoshi Faraga, who writes, Would you rather watch a Lord of the Rings reboot starring Daniel Radcliffe or a Harry Potter sequel trilogy starring Elijah Wood? Ah. That's weird. That's weird. <laughs> um... I'm always up for going back to see somebody else take a crack at Middle Earth. It wouldn't affect how great the originals are, so I would, I would see another Middle Earth film. I think I lean towards the same. I mean, I'm not familiar with the books, so this is kind of a blind statement to make, but I feel like there's more to explore there, whereas with Harry Potter, I feel very locked into a particular set of characters in a very small area of that world, but then again, Rowling's always adding new stuff, so I don't know, but I still think I lean towards uh, more, uh, more Middle Earth with Daniel Radcliffe. I want to chuck Daniel Radcliffe and Elijah Wood into God Emperor Dune. Sandwich ah, stuff. There you go. <laughs> Not going to those other ones. Just share that universe, let them fight predators on tanks. Yeah. I like where your mind's at. <laughs> if, you did, if you gave me the potential based on the first uh, Hobbit movie um, versus the potential based on Fantastic Beasts. I'm going way back to Middle Earth, and I don't want to see anything else. Like, I love the Harry Potter movies, those movies, but Fantastic Beasts, I found nothing that I want to see more of in that world necessarily. Wood and Radcliffe as Predator PIs chasing down a rogue Predator who is defaulting on his child support payments back on their planet. Played, you know, played by J.K. Simmons. Oh. Pushing this crappy script across my desk, and I got to tell you, I finally read it. Let's make this movie. <laughs> All right, what's next? The next one comes from Movie Fan, who writes, Over or under 40%, mm. Deadpool 2 becomes the first rated R movie to make a billion dollars. Keep in mind its first box office and pop culture reverence. Yeah, um, I think the, the, the first one, did it crack $700 million? No, The first Can, Predator? Yeah, no, so sorry, right the now. first Deadpool? Oh, the first Deadpool. <laughs> yeah, um, it did. It, it cracked did, seven. It cracked seven, I believe. It was either six or seven. Yep, worldwide. Um, yeah, it, it, it got close to 40 percent is a great over under number because if you put it at 60 or 70 percent i may not take that but i will at 40 percent i will take the over i think i think on a 40 percent line i will take the over that'll reach deadpool 2 would hit a billion um now i i think that now we we had we had such the first deadpool overperformed so much that now we're putting our expectations up there it's really tough for a sequel to do what the original movie did even in the world of comic book movies so I, 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 even though it's only 40%, I got to go under for a bit. Going under 40%? Yeah, I'm, I'm going under, too. Even though this movie made a ton of money, sequels, more often than not, sequels make a little less than the first movie. Even Age so. of Ultron, I think, did less than the first movie. Yeah, yeah, so if that's the case, I'm going to say under. I'm going to say over, simply because I think Deadpool was a, a sleeper hit, um, similar to Guardians, where it just kind of hit. 
and people are like, wow, I didn't know this was going to be like this. So there is now an expectation and a desire for the second film more so than when you see the first film and it's like, wow, it's, it's amazing. A lot of people never know there's going to be a sequel anyway when they see a first film. But I think also adding cable to the mix is going to add just a little bit more uh, box office. So. I don't know if cable will add more boxes. The average film goer has never heard. No, but I'm cable. saying it's Josh Brolin. I think when people see the trailer for Deadpool 2, well, I guess yes. I should rephrase it. Not that anybody knows who the hell cable is outside of the sweaties. I'm saying when they see this trailer for Deadpool 2 with Domino and cable and whatever they've got planned, I think that's going to increase the hype for everyone who loved the first Deadpool, and then it's going to go over even bigger. Yeah, and like I said, I think with the, along the lines of what you guys are saying, I think if the line was 70%, I would have taken the under. But at 40, I just I think that's too tempting to take. All right, let's take two more quick ones. Okay, this one comes from Kyle Marquis, who writes, what are the chances Universal MonsterVerse is building to a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen reboot? Thanks. Wow, I, I hadn't thought of that. Look, the idea, first of all, if you haven't read the original graphic novels, like all, the series of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it's some fun crap They're to fantastic. read. fantastic. It's really, really good. And the idea behind League of Extraordinary Gentlemen like with the idea with an Alan Quartermain leading the like it's a great idea mm -hmm. the first movie was just not executed right, right. at all like right. right from concept all the way through so that didn't work it's the film that Sean Connery turned down the role of Gandalf because he wanted to go do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen let that sink in for a little mm -hmm. bit but i think that the basic idea is a great i don't think that's what universal is building up to i don't think that's what they were doing but I think it's an intriguing idea. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, the, the, it's, it's, it's a good concept in theory, but we know what they're leading towards, John. Let's just say it's, they're leading, breaking news, it's going to be Monster Squad. We're going to get new <laughs> Monster Squad. That's the universe that we need to reboot. Yeah, I don't think that's that's happening, but, <laughs> but I kind of get a kick out of the idea too. But no, no, sorry. I think they are leading towards that because of the latest mummy featurette about Jekyll and the prodigium. The whole idea of having the prodigium is so that you can have like a meeting area of the minds of like maybe it's the Invisible Man, Dr. Jekyll, all the different characters, and they're fighting other monsters. So there is going to be a bad monsters versus badder monsters situation <laughs> in this universal monsters world and i think whether they're going to call it you know battle of the monsters so or whatever it's a they're suicide gonna, squad of monster movies pretty much yeah i don't know what they're going to call it but it's going to be centered around the prodigium they're introducing it and it will be like a league of extraordinary gentlemen it's going to be centered around a high school schnapp and kids <laughs> who form together to stop monsters all right last question of the day Last one comes from Isaiah Stodola, who writes, The Academy just announced that Jimmy Kimmel will be back for the 2018 Academy Awards. Do you think this is a good idea? Look, I, uh, every, most people know I prefer the idea of a movie personality hosting the, move, the biggest night of the movies. Uh, but I like Jimmy Kimmel, and I was okay with him hosting. I thought Kimmel did a really good job hosting the Oscars. I think he did a really good job. And I like the fact that instead of traditionally like they do, wait till like November to announce who's hosting the awards next, they came out and say, no, nah, he crushed it. We're gonna let him do it again. Uh, I'm all for it. Cause like I said, he really impressed me with how he handled, especially we're coming off a number of years in a row where it's been questionable. Like with been hosting, mm -hmm. starting with the Franco thing and right. all that kind of crap. I think it's good. It's like, look, if he keeps doing as good of a job as he did that first one, he could be the next Billy Crystal. I mean, he. I mean, I could see him hosting the Oscars for the next seven, eight years, if he does as good of a job as he did the last year. We'll have to wait and see. What do you think, Schnapp? Yeah, I'd like to see him come back. I didn't think he did that great of a job. I'm not saying he was schlubby or anything, but it was just oh, yeah, like he wasn't Billy Crystal or yeah, anything. Yeah, it I just he did you know, I good. think some of the jokes didn't work. Some of the jokes did work, but I mean, if you're going to gauge him against a everyone else who's come before him in the last five years, I think let's give him another shot. So. I sure. agree. I think that was one of the best ceremonies, minus the ending, that we've had in a really long time. I was entertained all the way through. I thought it flew by. He did a great job. I don't think there's any reason, after he did such a good job, to start looking for anyone else. If you back the truck up to Eddie Murphy's lawn and he says no again this year, then yeah, I think Kimmel's great. Because in my mind, the three greatest hosts of the Oscars have ever had are Bob Hope, Johnny Carson, and Billy Crystal. So Bob Hope, what, he made movies, but he was primarily known as a comedian. Johnny Carson was not in movies. He was a great talk show host. Billy Crystal was primarily known for movies. I think Jimmy Kimmel was going back to the Johnny Carson mold, but mm -hmm. I'm okay with that because mm -hmm. like you, I thought he knocked it out of the park last year. Not everything he did hit Schnepp, but he had bits. Like that bit when they brought the uh, the tourists in mm -hmm. and they walked, that, yeah. that could that have gone great. so horrifically wrong and been such an awkward 10 minutes of airtime, and he made it one of the most memorable parts of that show. Totally. 
So I think all the goodwill going towards Jimmy Kimmel right now with his son just being born, the fact that he's an ABC guy, this makes all the sense in the world, and I'd welcome him back for next year. I I'd still would really love to see Kevin Spacey host an Oscars. I think he would crush it, but I'm okay with Kimmel too. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, lots of other shows here on the Collider Video Network. Check out our, the front page of our YouTube channel and see all the stuff that we have to offer. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to thank the panel with me. First of all, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and uh, Twitter, just at John Schnepp. Uh, my heroes just dropped yesterday. Check out my Kickstarter. I'm trying to make a weird book called Isolated Mutations of the Assembly Line Baby. Say that 80 times fast. <laughs> See you later. Right beside me, we got Perry Nemiroff. Uh, P. Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram. And Collider Behind the Scenes. Egg Wars continues this weekend. Right beside me, Mark <laughs> Ellis. Uh, Schmoes No Live tonight, John, at 7 p.m. PST. This is actually good news about Kimmel because the GoDaddy site for Mark Ellis Hosts Oscars 2018 <laughs> is unavailable anyway. So go check out Mark Ellis Hosts Oscars 2018. 2019.biz. Okay, sorry. This is also coming in from the staff right now. Apparently, Variety is reporting that Power Rangers 2 has been greenlit. John. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. Sorry. Oh. Is, oh. sorry, Perry. So sorry. I'm so thing. sorry. I think I saw Perry's eyes like oh. light up for a second. <laughs> you know what? I instantly regret doing that. I'm so oh. sorry. <laughs> it's like a million <laughs> souls just blew up like Alderaan. I saw Not her. Yet. Just, oh. Luxembourg and Mongolia. Oh. Get all the bitcoins you guys oh. can scratch right. together and go see Power Powering. Bitcoins. Oh. And of course, over there, we've got Ashley Mova. <laughs> Poor Perry. You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Sorry. and YouTube. Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And of course, Wendy Lee. The Movie Couple channel on YouTube and at Wendy Lee's 80 on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And of course, you guys can find me on uh, Facebook and on Twitter and all around the world just crushing Perry's dreams. Uh, <laughs> you follow me simply at John Campion. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time. Bye-bye. Go, go, Power hey Rangers. Guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.